Wow. So this is what Sugar Grove Church of Christ all looks like, huh? Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's not exactly right, because we got a lot of folks out today. We've got uh, uh, all of our young people, I guess not all of them, but a bunch of them, and uh, workers are at Soul Link, and then the next couple of weeks is going to be, uh, uh, what do you call that, spring break. So it's going to be three-fourths of the way through March before we really get a feel, really, of kind of how all of this is. So I want to say a special thank you to Matt McVeigh and Van Crackett, uh, Van Crackett, I call him Crackett all the time, Van <laughs> Perdue and Taylor, <laughs> and Taylor Belt. Uh, for this layout, they've really studied hard. They talked to everybody except the fire marshal about how this could all look. And so we've got some stuff going on here. And they've done a good job. We wanted to have, uh, you know, you need to have a little over 100 seats empty so folks can, uh, guests can come in and that sort of stuff. And so they did. So here's phase two of this. If it doesn't work out, we're going to get some, uh, there's some things they saw advertised. I think we got a picture of it. Cubicles that, put a, whoa, that's just in case, y'all. So. That's cubicles that we stack up to the ceiling. Do we have a picture of that somewhere uh, for people to get? So that's what we're going to do if we, yeah. Y'all, I want to say thank you to the ushers. We've got ushers that are, uh, that are helping us out. Ushers, how's it gone this morning? Everything okay? Everything good? Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. There you are, Mary. Thank you. I saw you. Doing good. Super good for that. We've also got a parking lot crew that's been helping us out a bit. They're kind of a skeleton crew this morning. Uh, hopefully there's going to be more because parking could become an issue for us. So thank you. Let me ask all of you guys, how do you feel about being jammed up and jelly tight? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Now, why are we doing this again? You guys, remember, why are we kind of getting all scrunched up and uncomfortable and all that sort of stuff? Well, we're doing that because we're launching our new vision, of course, and we want to emphasize that. But we're also doing that uh, to, to just experience our, our wholeness uh, together. Uh, particularly, as you look at that vision, you begin to think about some of the things that we've been saying about being balanced with between our gathering and our scattering. We want something, an experience where we come together after six days of being warriors out on the field doing discipleship, where we come together and we're really encouraged and we really find ourselves strengthened by being with each other and looking into the Word of God. So we wanted to emphasize that in a strong way. And even though we're crowded here, we know there's always room for God, right? God is always here and God's doing what God does. Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 24 and 25 really speak to my heart. When we come together, and not that you don't do that in smaller groups, but when we all come together, I get that, I really have that sense uh, that God is there spurring us on to love and good works as we interact with each other and as we see each other. And there's a sense in which even what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, still true here, when we come together, people fall down and say, surely God is in this place. Not because of what we're doing or how we do it, but because we are the people of God and we're seeking God and we're looking for His Spirit and His Spirit is filling us. Let me tell you just a little bit about this. And I read about this after we were thinking about doing the kinds of things that we're doing. Pixar Studios. You ever heard of Pixar Studios, anybody? Okay, yeah. They came out with a blockbuster hit back in 1997. Anybody know what it was? Yeah, Toy Story. Anybody in here not seen Toy Story? Okay, three people, all right. You need to hire some grandkids somewhere and go out there because they'll, they'll drag you to Toy Story for sure, all right? Toy Story. So here's the thing about Toy Story. After they made Toy Story, they made 11 more feature films just as big and gigantic as Toy Story was. International attention is what it received. So questions begin to go out in that community about what makes these guys so successful. Let me tell you, there's two key words that are significant at Pixar, something you're going to hear all the time. Teamwork and collaboration. Now, let me tell you what they did. When they first started, they were going to build three buildings to occupy, to house Pixar Studios. Building A was going to house management. Building B was going to house the computer programmers. And building C was going to be the animators. But before that could happen, Stephen Jobs, have you ever heard of that guy? Kicked that in the head and instead bought an old Del Monte canning factory. Big, huge building, had rooms on the sides, but it had in the middle of it a huge room and an atrium right in the middle. His notion is, is that people need to run into each other. They need to, that's how they deepen relationships, and that's when they share ideas. That notion is right at the center of it. Run into each other, deepen relationships, and share ideas. Now, he went so far as to do this. In the atrium, he moved some meeting rooms in there. He also moved everybody's mailbox down there, so you had to go and you had to 
You had to mix it up, right? Everybody's mailboxes were down in there. You had to go to the, the only bathrooms in the whole building were down in the atrium. All right? And so when you got to go, you got to go, right? So they would go, and so you would meet people. The only place you could get coffee in that building was in the atrium. Everything there all together. And at first, people were saying, no how, no way. We just, you need to go to the bathroom. I've got to go all the way. But now they've caught on to the whole idea and how that works. In fact, one producer says, if I don't see a lot of smooshing, that's a term there at Pixar. If you don't see a lot of smooshing going on, he says, I get worried. Brad Bird, the guy that directed The Incredibles and Ratatouille, he said, here's, here's how it works, and here's the vision that Stephen Jobs had. When you bump into each other, you make eye contact. Now, and that's, he says, that's when things begin to happen. Now, here's the deal, y'all. We're not Pixar Studios, right? And thank God for that. But we are the people of God. And we have in our presence God Almighty Himself working out a purpose within us as we smoosh, as we come together, as we worship together, as we, as we make our ways down the hallways. And by the way, that's really the idea behind the front porch. Originally, the front porch wasn't going to begin until uh, today. Actually, it was going to be the inaugural day. And we decided we really can't wait on that. That's the time, that's the place over there across the hall, right? Where between service and class, we all kind of get together and we do all of this stuff and we, and things happen. Things happen. We're aware of God's presence. We want God's presence. We seek God's presence. And it's good when we can all be together. Now, I want you to look at Psalm 63 just for a second. Psalm 63 is one of my favorite psalms. Y'all excuse me just for a second. I've got, how are y'all's allergies? Mmm. Mine too. And I'm taking some stuff that really drives me out, so I apologize for that. Psalm 63, I love the way it starts. What a beautiful, passionate psalm it is. Verse 1 says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. Uh, he's not interested in checking a box, right? My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Some people have supposed that David was actually in one of his uh, times when he was running away from Saul. That he was in a desert somewhere. In fact, if you'll notice, there's a little subscript up here. And you know that that's not inspired, but it's very, very old, right? A psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. Maybe that's what it was. Or maybe this is just metaphorical. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. It sounds like a song that we sing sometimes, right? Well, David didn't get that from our song. We got the song from David, right? And what he says right here. And his notion in all of this is, again, it's not some duty that I'm fulfilling. And there's not anything wrong with it. There is a duty that we have, I'm sure. I'm sure. But there is a hunger and a thirst for the presence of God. And do you know what he's talking about specifically? He's talking about worship. And you know how I know that? I know that because of verse 2. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. What does he see in the assembly? Amen is right, Gary. What does he see in the assembly? He sees God and he sees God's glory and he sees God's power and he sees God's love. Here's his community view of worship. Now, now, listen, you guys, I, I want you to know how we worship now and how they worship then is a lot different, right? But the concept of worship and the heart of worship has never changed a single solitary bit. And I see that. I'm going to tell you what. I've said this before, but I've got to say it again. I can come up here kind of down. I can come up here discouraged. I can come up here kind of empty. And just to see you guys... One of the first people I saw this morning was Joe McQueen. He came through this back door over here, and I'm coming down here to meet him. And Joe just smiling, and he said, how are you, brother? Let me tell you what. You talk, I saw the face of God in that. And I see the power of God in that. And I see the love of God in that. So, let me tell you, when we come together, all together, in our united wholeness, Here's what happens. He says, verse 4, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. The old Jewish idea that God's blessings are poured out on uplifted hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. You know what my title is? What I've got written in pencil above that psalm, better than chocolate. That's what he's saying. You're better than chocolate. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Father, you are better than chocolate. 
You are so rich and your life, your existence, your being fills us so deeply. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for this body of believers that's here. We hold it all up to you, Father, in Jesus' name and amen. amen. Have a seat, you guys. You can sit down for a little while, okay? <laughs> By the way, I just want to tell you about that contribution that the kids... Go- wow, there's a lot of cash in there, y'all. I want to tell you about that. This goes to Lilia's place. It goes to two children in particular, Cherry Lynn and her brother John in Lilia's place to support them. they got some special needs. And whatever is over... Uh, their needs, then there are that money goes to teacher salaries there at uh, Lilia's Place. So it really is a great uh, expression, a great thing that our kids are doing. I want to ask you a question here. What would it be like, if you can imagine this, what would it be like if you um, found out that you were not who you thought you were? Now that happens to me periodically. I'll say something I didn't think I'd ever say. Has that ever happened to you? Or I'll do something I said, man, I didn't think I would ever do. Has that ever... Yeah, I do that too. But I'm not talking about that. I mean, what if you discovered one day that there were some things about you that you didn't know about? Somehow or another, it had gotten totally past you. You didn't know anything about it. Well, let me tell you about a guy named Stephen Carter. In January of 2011, he was looking at the Internet at a missing child site. And there was a composite picture there of what this missing child would look like if he were an adult. And Steve looked at that and he said, man, that looks a lot like me. But it couldn't be him because he had never been a missing child. He, he, he grew up in an orphanage, but he knew the story all the way through. He had never been a missing child. He never even, it just, it just, what was that all about? But he couldn't get over how much that composite looked like him. So one thing led to another. And finally, it led to a DNA test. And it found out that Stephen Carter was not really Stephen Carter. He was Marks Barnes. And it's an odd, strange story, the way all of that sort of uh, took place. 1977, June 21st, 1977, he was six months old. His mother put him in a stroller to go walk down this Hawaiian island where they were living. And he gets really involved and confused and obfuscated after that. By the end of the day, she was in a psychiatric ward. And he was under the care of the state of Hawaii. And soon became a ward of the state and grew up in an orphanage not 30 miles from where his birth parents had lived at one time. He said, I never had an urge to look and find out. He said, I I thought I knew my story. Never had an urge to look, didn't want to look. But there was one person that looked. And it was his half-sister. When she found out that there was a brother... And she wouldn't give it up. It had been a cold case. He'd been missing for a while. I don't know how all of that, well, I do, because it's complicated. But but how all of that had happened. And and so she pressed it. She pressed it and pressed it. And that's why that composite picture came up. And the rest is, is history, as they say. Now, can you imagine what that would be like? To discover something like that about yourself? Well, let me tell you. It's happened to me several times not by looking at the internet but by looking in the book every once in a while a composite picture emerges when I look into that book maybe I'm looking at the children of Israel in the Old Testament and I'm seeing their arrogance and their pride and their rejection and their selfishness and all of those things and then are, 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 and I see them as they are under the kings and I see how ruthless they can be and you know what there's a composite picture that begins to emerge and it looks a lot like me and it's not it's not a pretty picture sometimes I see it in the stories that Jesus would tell like in Luke chapter 15 the story of the prodigal son I've been there and then some and it's not a pretty picture. Or, or as that story progresses to the older brother, the religious guy who couldn't seem to really understand what his relationship with God was really all about, I see there's a composite picture of me that emerges in that. And it's not a pretty picture. Sometimes I see it in the conversations that Jesus would have, like the conversation he had in Mark 10 with the rich young ruler who said, tell me what one thing I need to do in order to, to ha- inherit eternal life. I like that part of the picture. Can you see yourself in that? But then Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And then it says, he went away sad because he had a lot of stuff. 
And then I see myself, once again, in that composite picture. Now, you may be thinking, well, you're reading the Bible all wrong. There's good news in that book, and there, there is. But I don't think I'm reading it all that long, particularly when I talk about uh, stories that are there, because Paul seems to say in 1 Corinthians 10 and in Romans 15, that's there so that we can see ourselves. In fact, James says, when you look into that book, don't forget what you look like. And after all, when I look into the Word, I realize I'm looking into a document that's alive. It's living. It's not some, it's not some dead letter. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 just for a second, starting in verse 12. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. If you've looked into the Word at all, I know that you've experienced that. And you've seen a composite emerge about you. And it's not a pretty picture. You know why? Not because you're just particularly bad. We're just broken people. At best, we're broken people. Nothing in all creation, verse 13, is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. But here's what excites me. That's not the only composite picture that I see in the text. There's another composite picture that begins to take shape. Somebody I've never even seen before. In fact, it's of somebody that I cannot actually see in this life and survive the encounter. I'll die if I see him. And yet, about 2,000 years ago, somebody came, was born onto this planet, named Jesus. He claimed to be God. In fact, here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 1. He's the exact representation of his nature. And I begin to get this composite picture of what God is like. And when I look at the Bible as a whole, I see all facets to this great personality that we call God. He's, a, he's, he's creator. He is sustainer. He's judge. Right. And we ought to fear him. But the one thing that emerges most clearly to me is he's a daddy. He's an Abba father. And in him lies love and joy, and peace, and gentleness, and patience, and kindness, and goodness. An ocean of grace. And let me tell you, those, those composites merge at a knobby little old hill outside the ancient city of Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, I become his boy. I become his child. And every day, every Sunday, when we come together and we celebrate the Lord's table together as God's family, we are remembering, we are commemorating, we are reflecting over what he did at Calvary for us. And the old rough spots of my composite begin to fade away. And through his grace, I can look like Jesus. That's what we celebrate. Let's go to the Father in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for divine grace. Thank you for the beauty of it. Father, as we come together this morning, we gather around your table. That's what we call it. It's communion table. It's the Lord's Supper. We gather around that table to remember and to reflect, to be grateful, Father, for who you are and what you've done in our lives. So I'm asking, Father, that as we do that, we want to do it in memory of you, as, the, as Scripture says. We want to be thinking about you. And we want to be blessed, Father, by a God who has saved us by the blood of his own precious Son. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen.